Well, what's been happening? Um, first of all, uh, thank you for all your well wishes and inquiries about my little incident. So, what happened was, when was it, what day was it? Was it, I mean, um, Wednesday night, about 1am at night, I'm asleep. Oh, and a pain in my sort of side woke me up. Like a shooting pain. Like, oh, I mean, that never happens. So, oh God, what was that? And it happened again. And my first thought was obviously liver cancer. <laughs> right. And it, uh, in the middle of the night, that praise, you, you're convinced. Well, that is, that is it. I've blown it, you know. And, uh, and I got another pain that, oh, oh, God. And then I felt sick. And I went to throw up, but I couldn't. Which I thought, oh, maybe it's stomach cancer. <laughs> right? And then I couldn't be sick. There was nothing there. But the pain of the vomiting was incredible. It was an intensity. And you forget how bad vomiting is. You know what I mean? You just forget how fucking awful. I mean, never mind the illness and thinking you're going to die. You can't breathe. And I think I'm going to choke. I think that I'm not going to get my breath back between it. And the spasm. Like the next day, even when I was over it, if I coughed, my ribs... I think I, I thought oh, I've ripped my stomach line in here. So... <laughs> right... All this is happening in my head as as well. And then, um, and then uh, that happened a few times and I, I started sweating and cold sweating. I thought, what is this? I thought, ah, oh, it's coronavirus. I've had that before. Uh, I called it off one of my nieces or great nieces. One Christmas, they were, you know, everyone got ill. And again, that happened in the middle of the night as well. So I, I sort of started recognising it. Oh, Jesus. That didn't stop me thinking at one point that it might have been radiation sickness. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, well, it could be. You know what I mean? You never know. Someone might have been walking behind me with a bit of plutonium <laughs> once. <laughs> I... But anyway, I was pr pretty sure after a couple of hours this was coronavirus. So I was, I was, I was trying to fight it then, and then, um, then it started. The other end started, which is a relief, really, because I'd rather it come out that way than fire my face. You know what I mean? Because diarrhea, you go whatever. You go, it's not, it's not me. I'm not. I can't. It's just happening, right? Emptying, like just pulling the plug. But. Oh, yeah, I think everything, I'd rather everything came out that way. And then I was still sort of wretched as well. And then nothing was coming, and then a bit of sort of brown stuff. I thought, fuck me, is that bile? Or am I vomiting from my ass? Right? Because I also, I know, I know sort of too much, but not enough. Because I... You know, like I knew that a cyanide poisoning makes, you know, reverse peristalsis from the bout. So you, you die of vomiting your own shit. Right? So I thought, <laughs> that was like I had some cyanide. <laughs> but anyway, but in general, give me diarrhea over vomiting. Not even vomiting. Retching without the, without the relief of sick. Is this, is this interesting? Is this what you tuned in for? <laughs> Fucking hell. Has anyone talked about sick and shit as much in any broadcast ever? Um, so anyway, so, you know, it was sort of one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock rock. And, um, and it's both ends. Right? And uh, I know a lot of people during coronavirus, they've told me that they were sitting on the toilet and throwing up in the bath. Now, because I've got a bit of cash my bath is fucking miles from the toilet right so i couldn't do that so i was having to spin round i was trying to try and time it <laughs> i'd go uh, no quick sit down um <laughs> so 
Uh, the old Roxy Music song, Both Ends Burning, springs to mind. So anyway, then I, I couldn't, I couldn't even, water made me feel sick. I couldn't even rehydrate because water gave me the sort of urge to throw up and it hit my stomach. Um, and then eventually, uh, I, I uh, what worked, I had a bit of, I had a Lemsip and a Gavis gone, is it Gavis gone? And it sort of, it sort of worked well. I could lay, I could lay down without wanting to be sick. If I moved, I wanted to be sick, but I could lay down. And uh, the, 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 it was all over by about six o'clock that morning. I still couldn't get up. I couldn't, I couldn't eat. So I think I got up about, um, I had a, a half a banana for lunch in bed. And I think I eventually got up about three o'clock that afternoon. And it was, it was all over. I still felt weak. I mean, I couldn't even face a beer till about eight o'clock that night. <laughs> so yeah, that's the story. Unbelievable. Don't want that again. That's the other thing, you know it's gonna happen again one day, don't you? You know it's gonna, you know. Anyway, um, questions. Clem, last week you sold out the Hollywood Bowl. Do you have to pinch yourself sometimes? Yeah, oh, it's still, yeah, it's still surreal. Particularly that, that was, that is a particularly surreal thing to do. For a British stand-up comedian, to play the Hollywood Bowl, let alone sell it out, is pretty amazing. Um, but yes, yeah, so I don't take any of this for granted. I wake up every day thinking I've got to, come on, I've got to, got to do something here. I've got to keep, you know, you try and keep improving and keep interest in it and you're grateful. No, I, I, I'm not one of those that thinks I can do anything and it just lasts forever. You have to, you have to work at it. In fact, in a way, it sort of gets harder because you're judged by your last thing. So the better your last thing is, the harder it is for you to beat it. Um, so yeah, I do. I, I, I can't believe it. I, I, I mean, I always look back to my beginnings, really. I'm very, very grateful. And I know how, I know how lucky I am in a way. Because it is, it, there is an amount of luck, you know, it could have happened to someone else. There's, there's loads of people that are as good and work as hard and it doesn't happen. Um, so, uh, yeah, of course I did. Uh, Chloe, what was the best thing about playing the Hollywood Bowl? It being over, if if that makes sense. I, I, even before I went on, I knew that it was like a parachute jump. You can't really enjoy it on the way down, particularly the first time, because you think, what if this parachute doesn't open? And then the parachute opens and you can enjoy it a bit more. And then you land and you go, oh, I didn't die. And then the endorphins kick in. You go, oh my God, that was amazing. That was amazing. Because you didn't die. And you sort of almost enjoy it in retrospect. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, doing the achievement and doing it. And then you look back, you know, it was a beautiful night. Uh, everyone had a great time. Yeah, I just, it was surreal, it couldn't have been better. Kina, do you get any anxiety before playing gigs at massive venues? Yes, such as the States. If so, how do you deal with this? Well, if you mean the Hollywood Bowl, yes. And I don't usually. People say, do you get nervous for a gig? And I say, no. I'd never get ner nervous for a gig. I know what I'm doing. I, you know, the warm-ups, I don't know if I laugh or not, but it's just, that's what it's about, and you enjoy that. And then by the time you're playing arenas, you know it works, and it sort of works every night. Um, uh, I think I've, the only time I've got nervous is like the Golden Globes, because it's live, and there's... 100 million people watching. So if you make one mistake, everyone sees it and you can't take it back. Um, but I don't usually get nervous for a gig. 
Uh, but I did with the Hollywood Bowl, and I don't know whether it was the sense of occasion, or it was the unknown, or it was so big. The sound check, I walked out of the sound check, and I went fucking out. Because it's not just a big venue, it sort of goes on forever, and it, and it goes into nature. There's no walls. It just sort of, the, just the, the seats go on forever, and the, into the trees. It's like a natural, I don't know what you'd call it. It's like a, it's like a valley. And they built this state. Uh, oh, and when I went out, the crowd were amazing. It was, uh, you lose your nerves immediately, actually. As soon as you walk out, you, you're, you're at work. And you lose, you forget everything. It's just a gig then. But the weird thing about it was, all my fears just, they disappeared. I was thinking, what if they're not listening? Of course they were listening. They paid, some of them paid thousands of dollars and I'm going to go and not listen, right? So, but these, they, they, these play on your mind. What if it rains? It, it didn't. Uh, at first of all, I said, when um, the promoter said, I said, what about the echo? So big. Well, there's no echo because there's no walls. Oh, yeah, of course. Science. Um, so it was just, it was great immediately. But um, with the, the thing that it's built in, like an aircraft hangar, like the shape of a, I don't know, like a sky dish, right? There's birds roosting. So I went out and there's a roar of the crowd, but all these birds were sort of woken up. So the crowd couldn't hear them, but I could hear, I was, it was, I was like playing a gig in an aviary. <laughs> so it was quite sweet. It was quite like a Disney cartoon. Um, uh, so yeah, I, um, I don't usually get anxious, uh, but I did there. How'd you deal with it? you just got to go, you just got to go, it's, what's the worst that can happen? It, you don't have to do it once, you know, you're not filming it. It's not, it's not like, you know, the, 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 you, I've got to get everything perfect. You just play with it and um, you're just going to work, really. You just got to go, you're going to work. And you think, oh, what a privilege. This is a privilege. This is amazing. Um, but the thing that gets me through it is, They've paid money to see you. They want to like it. Do you know what I mean? 20,000 people don't buy a ticket to go there and go, this is rubbish. You, you, you know, they're your fans, really. If I walked out, you know, if, um, I don't know, One Direction were playing and I went out and said, can I do 20 minutes, lads? I, I might struggle. <laughs> But they're all there to see me, so it, it couldn't it couldn't be more conducive to being a brilliant gig, um, and it was it was amazing, and I, and uh, yeah, it's still it is still surreal. So thanks to everyone who bought a ticket and everyone who tried, and um, yeah, it was an amazing night. Um, and the promoter said you could do this again, and I went when, and they went do it again in eighteen months, and I thought I was very flattered, but I think. I'd quite like it to be, there's part of me that goes, I could do even better, and it'd be amazing to play it twice. But I think that there's something amazing about playing it once, if that makes sense. It, it makes it more special. That time I played the Hollywood Bowl. Um, but we'll see. Uh, Sam, when you do your live shows in countries where English isn't their first language, um, do you have to adjust your sets at all? Do some jokes not land as well? Talk, um, well, I only play countries where English is their second language, but they are fluent in it. So, um, and also, any country you play, uh, they're only going if they speak English. They know I'm not doing it in their language. So even if you, wherever you play, if you play, you know, a big country, um, you only need a few thousand people that are fluent in your language and they're the only ones that go along. Um, and also there are, there are certain countries that, that there is no language barrier at all. Scandinavia, you know, Benelux countries, um, you know, cosmopolitan areas of most European, most of Europe speaks English. 
we're English people are the lazy ones. Um, so n no, uh, I do make some. I, I probably do speak a bit clearer. Also, when I'm playing an overseas venue, I'm playing big venues because I'm only there one night. So I do play big. Uh, venue so you sort of speak clearer anyway you speak to the back of the room and articulate a bit more so that that certainly helps um, I, I talk about universal subjects I'd never talk about what I watched on channel 4 last night I'd never talk about you know British Big Brother I talk about you know universal subjects you know um, AIDS Hitler cancer famine those dudes are evergreen. Um, so uh, I talk about universal subjects. Um, the thing that sometimes catches you out, that even though they speak fluent English and I understand every word you say and your cultural references are universal, um, there, was a, there was a thing in, uh, I think it was in Supernature, where the punchline was, um, uh, it was then I realised... I could kick myself. And in some countries, it didn't get the laugh. And I'm like, oh, they don't know what... That's a euphemism. They don't know, why would you kick yourself? They don't have that saying. So I had to change it to... Um, oh, and then I realised I'd made a terrible mistake. Right? So it's things like that that you don't... That you, and, we, and we use a lot of euphemism. We use a lot of sayings and euphemisms that we just take for granted. You can't have your cake and eat it. You know, and people go, what do you mean you can't have your cake and eat it? What? Um, so you don't realise that those euphemisms are really uh, sort of parochial in a way. Um, but outside that, everything works everywhere, really. I mean, certainly 99% of it. Uh, but yeah, you do think about those things. Uh, Glenn, Ricky, have you got a stand-up venue on your bucket list? Where is your dream place? I haven't because I wouldn't really know about them until I've played them. There's certainly places I go, oh my God, that was magical. I definitely want to play there again. And, and uh, I think given that if they speak fluent English, um, the venue probably makes more of a difference than the country in many ways. Uh, when you're playing 10,000 people, people are the same, you know. Uh, but there are certainly magical venues and, and magical cities like, you know, Dublin. Dublin's always, it's always amazing. It's always, it's always one louder. Uh, uh, I think the Olympia in Paris was great. Rock and roll venues are really good. The, what You know, those rock and roll... Um, sort of uh, places that are sort of old, established venues. Victoria th Victorian theatres are really good. They're packed in and they're shaped right. It's perfect um, for comedy. But now arenas are getting better. I didn't like arenas at first, but now arenas are built better with better acoustics and um, the better shape and uh, better sound. Uh, and with the big screens, it's, it's almost more intimate because they're, they're there, they're at the event, and they can look up and see your facial expressions that uh, they couldn't um, traditionally. Um, but, uh, um, uh, dream place, I, love, I like visiting places, I like finding out. So there's loads of places I haven't been. You know, I, I, what have I been to? I, I can't even work it out, a few percent of the world. Um, I, I, I heard, um, um, I think Afterlife certainly is uh, big in like you know South America, so I lovely I'd, I'd love to play somewhere like Argentina one day. It's just too far, isn't it? I've heard there's a new plane that goes like goes to America in like fifty minutes. I thought, oh, I'll probably be dead before it's. I don't know though. Technology's moving along, isn't it? So there, I'll fly around. I'll go. It, if I can get to anywhere in the world in a couple of hours, I will play everywhere. If it's really safe, I want someone else to test it first. Let 
I forget the name of the bloke who's doing it, but you know, let him test it. <laughs> I want to know this is, I want the stats. I want to see how, if they say this is safer than crossing the road, I'll do it. Um, Richard, are you a vegan for health or political reasons? Uh, well, neither. I, I think you mean ethical reasons. I'm a vegan because of ethical reasons. Um, I think. Uh, I think it is probably healthier in certain aspects, particularly for you know things like colon cancer and probably obesity and uh, cholesterol certainly. Um, but you can be an unhealthy vegan. I'm living proof. <laughs> and you can be a very healthy meat eater. So it's not that. No, it's ethical reasons. I just couldn't, I couldn't sort of live with myself anymore. I tried to convince myself that it was okay being a vegetarian. But then I found out what has to happen for you to have eggs. Like they fucking gas the baby male chicks or liquidise them just because they want... It's horrible. And I told myself that I only ate free range. And I found out that free range meant they have to have two feet instead of, you know, bolted in a cage. Uh, and then dairy. I, uh, I just couldn't... And I don't, I don't go around lecturing people about it because I think it's a slow process and I think people dig in. If I started lecturing people, telling them they're, they're bad. And also, I think there is something to be said with... Even if you're wrong... You know, that vegetarianism isn't any more ethical than, you know, eating meat. I think it's a step in the right direction psychologically. Because I think all you can do is be better than you were yesterday. That's all. Just change the world a little bit. And giving up, and giving up meat does make a difference to the world. Um, uh, there's this stat that if you eat meat every day, if you give up one day a week we could feed another 100 million people because just the amount of water and grain it takes to feed a cow to be eaten by a certain amount of people is like ridiculous times the amount of the nutrition you can get from plant-based things, you know, cutting down rainforests to feed cows and stuff. But, you know, I don't want a virtual signal because I think that, that, that annoys people and it puts them off and it makes them feel bad. And I just think you've got a You've got a, um, you've got a change, you've got a change for your own reasons, uh, but yeah, I do it. I do it for ethical reasons as opposed to health. I mean, it wouldn't make sense, would it, to eat plant-based stuff for health and then <laughs> drink a bottle of red wine? <laughs> uh, so no, I just want to go. Oh, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't kill or torture any animals today. It's it's that really. Um, uh, Jack, how does it feel knowing that afterlife has helped so many people? Amazing! It's the it is the best thing about it, and I never thought it would be. And I've never, I've never done anything, you know, in entertainment. In fact, I've been belligerent. I've gone, you know, art, art isn't to, you know, uh, change people's values or to preach is to entertain um and i i still did that with afterlife and it was a it was a happy coincidence that it did touch people in that way which shows that if you just do if you do what's passionate then you probably do make a difference anyway you don't have to try if you know what i mean i mean you can try not to harm anyone but um i just think if you do something that's genuinely interesting and entertaining and means something to you then it will mean something to other people um, uh, but yeah, it feels, I mean, just the sheer amount of people that watched it, I've heard it's like 125 million now, which is crazy. And, and that figure is who watched the whole series. I know that some, I think, I, I think it was like BBC iPlayer when they say that, oh, 12 million people watch this show. I, I looked at it, what, it, what they actually mean is that if it's like a six part thing, they mean that two million people watched each episode. So they go, well, that's 12. No, it isn't. 
That's two million people watched the whole episode. If I did that with Afterlife, what would that be? It'd be like 700 million people. No, 120 million people watched the whole show, um, which, is, which is staggering enough. Um, yeah, and that's what makes me worried about the next thing. What if the next thing I do only gets 50 million? <laughs> I feel, I feel like a fucking failure. I see them, I see these boy bands, right? So these poor, poor boy bands, and they're all at 17, and they've had three number ones. And I know that when they get a number two, their record company goes, you bad boys. <laughs> you bad, you fucking... Give us... A, fuck off. You're getting no more money. There's some... There's some other kids here. <laughs> So it's terrible. You mustn't just mustn't think about those things. You mustn't think about those things. It's lovely. You go, oh, that's good, and then you mustn't mustn't think about it. But you do. You do. Uh, Doris, how far have you got with a new series? Oh, Doris. Oh God, I. I mean, I've got two things on the go now that are almost at pilot stage. In fact, I've got. I've got. I've, I just thought there's a. There's a third thing as well um, that, that might happen. But I don't know what to do. I don't know whether to do one of them. I don't know which one to do. I don't know whether to do both. They've both been sort of greenlit, if I want to do them, by Netflix. I can't tell you about it, but... Anyway, one's animation and I'm in one. Um, but I've got... I've probably got... I've got the idea and the synopsis and... I've probably got a, like a, a cobbled together a pilot script, but I'm enjoying stand up too much. I would be happy to never do another show again. It's got to that stage, and not not just because I think I can't beat Afterlife or whatever, but I don't I don't know what there is to beat. Full stop. But I, there is something to beat with uh, stand up. I can change it every night. I can go with the flow. I can. I can see the world. I can. You know, I can be, I feel that like I'm braver in stand-up than anything else I do as well. Um, but, I, but I do love the other thing as well. I also feel guilty. I feel that like I should be working in the day. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. Uh, it's like you've got to write an essay and you think, oh, it's, I've got a few weeks yet. And it just gets close. You go, oh, I've got to write an essay soon. Um, that's why I never give myself deadlines. Because that would just stress me out. I'll do it when it happens. Or not. And there might be another idea that comes along and beats them both, you know, so I don't know. In fact, there is one other idea. A four idea. I've got four ideas, right? <laughs> um, uh, Spotify have sort of approached me. A few times, actually, and I've had a couple of talks to them, and I really want to do something with them. And I don't know what I want to do. But I thought, would this work? Would this work if I did it on Spotify? Like a half-hour show of me answering stupid questions? I think I've got 500 million subscribers. What would someone on Spotify just suddenly come across this and go, why is he talking to fucking cats and dogs? This, you know what I mean? They're well I don't know is the answer. But I've got stand-up to do first. That's what I've got to do first. Uh, Gunner, you have decided to start your own society. Here we go. See? Questions from dogs. You have decided to start your own society. You are the king, Natch. Of course I am. If I start my own society, why would I make myself the road sweeper? Um, what would be your first rule you would put into place? Hmm. Interesting. I suppose you've got to save the planet first, haven't you? Sustainable energy. I think people, as opposed to going around thinking that we've just got to stop all fossil fuels, I think we've also got to go, and this is in its place. You can't lecture poor countries about not using fossil fuel. You can't, you can't go to a continent of a billion poor people and go, you can't do that anymore, unless you've got something else to give them. So... We've got to come up with an alternative to that that's ruining the ozone layer. Because we have got to save the planet. 
we've destroyed 70% of all animal populations in my lifetime. And it's, and it's, you can't screw up the ecosystem like that. You've got to put, you've got to put some back. So I, I think I try and do that. I mean, I'd encourage plant-based diets. I think that's getting better. Again, when someone's tasted a vegan burger, they're not, they're not going, oh, there's no anus and bone and ears and, and you know what I mean? They go, it, it tastes like a burger. It's the tomato sauce and mustard and bread and onion and, you know, so I'd encourage that because that, that would save a lot of lives and save the planet. Um, and I'd introduce a welfare state. So everyone's got a chance, whatever your, whatever your background, whatever your, whatever country you're born into, that's no fault of your own, whatever, you know, whatever your family you're born into, that you can, that if you get ill, you can, you can be seen. There's enough money to go around. So yeah, sustainable energy, plant-based diets, a welfare state, including education. Education and healthcare, I think that's where it's at. Um, and adopt, if you get a dog, adopt it. <laughs> right, Leslie, everyone loves Derek. If you ever decide to do one, uh, one off special, begging question, would you consider creating a soulmate for him? I do think about doing Derek again, because I love it so much, but I think I shouldn't, so I probably won't. But yeah, I, I, when I end a series, I always give a little bit of hope and happiness. Um, uh, and yeah, it, it's amazing. I mean, the success of Afterlife is reflected on Derek as well. I think Derek went up like 40%. Derek is bigger now than it was um, when it first came out. Uh, the beauty of Netflix. Um, well, that's about it. Uh, um, I'm better now. The jet lag still hasn't gone yet. I've got one more day of that. That's a weird thing. Um, cheers, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for watching my shows and this. Be kind to animals. Tatty bye, everyone. Tatty bye. <laughs>